Time for Life Picks. Two things out on the big screen from today, starting with The Rescue. It's a documentary about the 2018 Thai cave rescue efforts. Remember that? 12 boys and their football coach trapped in a flooded cave in northern Thailand. And this documentary explores how expert divers navigated that rescue. Here with more is film correspondent John Louis. So John, what happened in 2018 was gripping to say the least. The awful situation that the boys were in and thankfully Hopefully the ordeal ended on a, on a largely happy note, I would say. It's also so visual. So what kind of footage can we expect to see in this documentary? Okay, after the event, you know, the whole world, the media teams, production companies wanted that story. So there have been one or two things out already. But uh, the major things are this documentary and a Netflix thing that's coming out next year so this one from national geographic who are you know leaders in documentaries they've taken an, uh, an uh, oscar award-winning team of two writers directors and producers elizabeth chai vasili and jimmy chin and they have taken footage from the point of view of the cave divers the mostly british team of cave divers and the thai navy seals so this whole film is archive footage as well as reenactments and graphics taken from the point of view of the people at the spearhead of the operation so it's a technical film but very satisfying as well if you want to know the nuts and bolts of the operation i see well john i remember in 2018, I was quite riveted to the entire story and, you know, the sequence of events. So I can imagine I'll be quite emotional if I saw it. When, after you caught it, what left an impact for you? Yeah, it was an emotional uh, uh, event. The thing about documentaries is that some of them are very manipulative emotionally. They tell you how you feel. They'll use dramatic music and lighting cues and color grading and all kinds of funny tricks to tell you how you should feel sad here. You should feel uplifted at this other point. This one doesn't. This one they've got. They know they've got brilliant footage. I mean, these are the, the GoPros that the divers had on their equipment going through the caves. And these are also cameras that were used by the Thai Navy SEALs. One of them, a former Thai Navy SEAL, died during the operation, if you remember. So this is brilliant footage, especially if you know a little bit about diving. And if you want to know how scary it was, we know it was scary, but when the cave divers are explaining it to you and you can see the footage, it's scarier than, than uh, most horror films. Well, thanks for that, John. The Rescue opens today exclusively at The Projector. Our next pick is also based on real events and real people, a biopic on Canto pop legend Anita Mui. Now, she died in 2003 at 40 years old following a battle with cervical cancer. Journalist Jan Lee is here with her take on this biopic. So, Jan, let's first cover its overall mood, tone, as well as the focus of the film. What can you tell us about that? Okay, so um, focus-wise, it's quite straightforward. It is just a retelling of her life from uh, when she was a kid uh, performing at, you know, like she called it, amusement park to, um, you know, her later life, including her battle with cervical cancer and her last performance in her life, right? Because famously, she held, I think it was eight concerts uh, two months before she died uh, because she wanted to marry herself to the stage. She wanted to... Uh, have a one last chance to to share the stage with her with her fans and everybody. So um, the mood and tone wise, uh, it's very nostalgic because you know it definitely is a production that put an effort to recreate um, Hong Kong in the 1970s and the 1980s and later on the 1990s when um, Anita Mui was very famous. And it is quite um, it, it's not the kind of Hong Kong that you see now because you know things change a lot in 20 30 years there are new buildings things get torn down so you see all these scenes of hong kong that you just don't really see anymore like this neon lights this old amusement parks old theaters you know that she used to perform at so it's it's very nostalgic i think that's the overwhelming sense i get from the movie okay. well model actress louise wong she portrays anita mui how did she fare in that role again 
apparently it took years for them to find a good candidate to play Anita Mui. And I think Louise Wong was chosen in part because she does have a resemblance to Anita Mui, her facial resemblance. But uh, I think she does okay. I think she's better in the first part of the movie when uh, Anita Mui is still a rising star, you know, when she's just new to the industry. She, she's... Uh, she went to a competition and that's how she got discovered and managed to uh, have an album out. So like the fa- the first part of the movie where she's rising, she's a little bit unsure of herself because she's not yet a superstar, right? Even though she has just boundless talent. That part of the movie, I think she does quite well. Um, I think near the second half of the movie where, uh, you know, Anita Mui is already very, very established. She, she is a superstar, like just, you know, bona fide superstar. Um, she lacks a little bit of that that fearlessness that people remember of her, that aura that people remember of Anita Mui. Um, but I would say that the costumes and um, I think the voice, because uh, from what I from what I understand, I think um, it was something similar to Bohemian Rhapsody where they merged Freddie Mercury's voice with Rami Malek's voice. So they sort of merged Louis Wong's voice with. Anita Mui and I think Louis Wong went through some training to make sure she can sound like her sound like Anita Mui I mean so it does help like the costumes the staging and you hear her sing it's quite hard not to feel emotional well thanks so much Jan the Anita Mui biopic is out in cinemas now well to wrap up today's live picks our food editor Tan Shia Yun is here to talk about niche Severu. it's a cafe in Tuapayo serving a mainly western menu now Shia this is especially useful for myself and our colleagues who still go to the office and don't mind walking a bit for a meal so what are your top picks over at that place well, um, I really love the Gula Melaka cappuccino. So I've had Gula Melaka with coffee and tea at various places. And usually the intensity is not there and you know the quality of the Gula Melaka is not great. But this one is so aromatic, there's a smoky flavour and there's enough of it that is that makes the cappuccino not too sweet but you also get the, uh, the taste of the Gula Melaka. So I'm kind of addicted to it actually. And the other thing I like about this cafe is that they, they do very good cakes and the Onde Onde cake is fantastic. It's really light and it's not like this horrible fluorescent green from fake colouring. So you know that they actually bother to go, you know, puree the, the pandan leaves and squeeze out the juice. And, um, and the frosting's not too sweet and there's this toasted coconut on top which is so good. Gula Melaka Cappuccino and a slice of the Onde Onde cake and that's a perfect tea time treat.